This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today I want to answer the question, does proof of work stop Bitcoin spam? This was initiated by Zach Herbert, who's co-founder and CEO of Foundation Devices. He writes, what if I told you that someone figured out a clever way to stop spam on the network and that it's been battle tested for over a decade and that no other solutions ultimately work? It's called proof of work. I think this is kind of a weird thing to be asserting because if proof of work keeps spam off the Bitcoin network, and if Bitcoin miners and mining pools are still using proof of work today, then why is there still so much spam on the Bitcoin network? It's really been a huge problem since at least 2023. Most of the spam takes advantage of the op false op if inscriptions hack, in which Bitcoin script is abused to trick it into relaying and holding non-monetary data like JPEGs. These inscriptions were included in blocks by miners. These ones we see here, these have all been mined. They've all been included in blocks by miners who did the necessary amount of proof of work. So I'm not sure how proof of work is helping to limit spam here, as Zach asserts. Proof of work also doesn't stop Mara from filling blocks full of spam. What stops that is decentralizing mining and mining pools using Ocean, using Datum, so that individual hashers or miners can build their own block templates that don't include spam. Bitcoin is already extremely vulnerable due to mining pool centralization, and this is something that proof of work apparently does not stop, as Zach asserts. We can see here we have Foundry, which is the big American mining pool, and then we have Ant Pool and Friends in China. I think what's happening here is I think Zach might somehow be conflating how hashing works in Bitcoin mining with how it works in Adam Back's hash cash, which was designed to cut down email spam by forcing email senders to perform a small computational task, which is not a burden for the regular email user since it takes only milliseconds and doesn't use any appreciable amount of computing power. But that is a huge burden for someone sending out millions of spam emails. So that's Adam Back's hash cash. Unlike hash cash, email, there's no proof of work associated with sending a Bitcoin transaction. I just need to attach a transaction fee and off it goes into everyone's mempools well before that transaction fee ever actually gets spent, which only happens when the transaction is mined and finds its way into a block. Any Bitcoin spammer can send his garbage into your mempool by attaching a transaction fee that's at or even below current market rates for transaction fees, and the spammer ends up paying only if the transaction eventually gets included in a block. And this means that under Bitcoin Core version 30, it's easy to turn Core 30 mempools into CSAM relay devices, relaying large unconfirmed op returns, all without proof of work even entering the picture. So maybe Zach can explain how proof of work and SHA-256 hashing can keep CSAM out of my mempool if I'm running Core 30, which I certainly will not be. Or maybe Zach could explain why proof of work couldn't keep CSAM off of BSV when they made the exact same change and blew open their op return filter from 80 bytes to 100,000 bytes in 2019. It's almost as if you need something additional to stop spam from being relayed, something additional to proof of work, something that doesn't pass on large unconfirmed op returns or unconfirmed op false op if inscriptions, something that filters, almost something like a filter. If you're finding this video interesting so far, just pause really briefly here to ask you to help to support this channel. Hit the subscribe button, that does really help. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video, and share this video with a friend or family member. So I responded to Zach and I wanted to go through some of the dialogue we had. I responded to his original post saying, filters have been battle tested for over a decade. How does proof of work keep CSAM out of my mempool? Zach responds, how do filters keep it out? My response was, are we gonna play platonic dialogue? Because I could see what was gonna happen here, that we were gonna go back to this sort of questioning. And I was wondering whether it was use, a, use, a good use of my time. Zach responds, I just haven't heard any argument about how filters can work indefinitely without needing to be consistently, constantly updated like a game of whack-a-mole. I would also like to better understand the gray areas. We all agree CSAM is morally reprehensible, disgusting, and none of us want that on our nodes. But what, what about other use cases that may be financial in nature? For example, if someone comes up with a better coin join style privacy tool that happens to use a lot of block space, are you gonna say that's spam and try to roll out new filters to crush that use case? Who gets to decide? So my, I responded to each of these comments in a sort of broken up fashion. Uh, Zach saying, I just haven't heard any arguments about how filters can work indefinitely. My response, the current debate is not about that. It's about whether a decade-old filter that has been working quite well should be removed. 
and then I respond, when changing Bitcoin, the burden of proof has always been on the person who wants to change it. So can you explain why you believe that data carrier size, which is the upper turn setting, should be blown wide open? I then respond to his CSAM point in which he says that we all agree that CSAM is morally reprehensible. My response is, if you run Core 30, your actions demonstrate to the world that you don't think it's that morally reprehensible because you're willing to relay unconfirmed CSAM upper turn transactions up to 100,000 bytes and help them get mined. So you can say you find something morally reprehensible, but when you're relaying it across the network, your actions demonstrate otherwise. So Zach responds, my understanding is that we know filters will not work in the long term because they already do not work now. There are numerous ways to get non-monetary data into the blockchain. Therefore, the idea is to try to push non-standard transaction data into OpReturn so that it is at least prunable. If this doesn't really work because of the SegWit discount, people are still going to use inscriptions and they're also going to use OpReturn if they want to do CSAM. By screaming about CSAM, Zach writes, you're taking a technical discussion that is nuanced and attempting to create hysterical emotional outbursts from those who are not technical enough to understand. I'm not sure what that means, not technical enough to understand what CSAM is and that it's in your mempool. Also, you did not at all address my concerns regarding what happens if you think certain data is spam, but I don't. My response, in which he says the filters are not even working now, my response was, if the upper turn filter is not doing anything now, what is the argument for removing it? You can't have it both ways. And why not combine the move with limiting the SegWit discount for ins the SegWit discount for inscription spam or adding an inscriptions filter? In terms of his accusation that I've been screaming about CSAM, my response was the exact same thing happened to BSV when they moved up return from 80 bytes to 100,000 bytes in 2018. Have you never heard of scenario risk analysis? So screaming about this, raising this risk when it's literally happened to a failed fork of Bitcoin that has very similar code, this is not screaming about something. This is raising a, a legitimate risk. His, uh, in response to his saying, if someone comes up with a better coin join style privacy tool that happens to use a lot of block space, uh, my response is, do I have some obligation to change the protocol today in order to anticipate something that hasn't happened yet? His, uh, his comment, what happens if you think certain data is spam and I don't? And then my response is, I like this definition of spam from Super Testnet. Chain spam is a transaction on the blockchain containing data such as text, pictures, audio, or video. A transaction on the blockchain is not spam. If in as few bytes as possible, it does one of only two things and nothing else. Transfers value on L1 or sweeps funds from an HTLC or similar address created while trying to transfer value on an L2. The term value means the value field in level one Bitcoin UTXOs and transferring it means reducing the amount in that field in the sender's UTXOs and increasing it in the recipient's UTXOs. This is the point we're at which now where we have to tell people what a Bitcoin transaction is. Zach never got back to me, so I, I asked him uh, 12 hours later, so Zach, are you going to respond to my responses? Do you understand the nuances of the different ways that things can get on-chain, like inscriptions, op-return, Coinbase inscription, uh, Coinbase transaction, etc.? Zach's response to me at that point, honestly, I don't really want to take the time. It's clear that your principles are wildly different from mine. I don't think arguing is going to go anywhere. This is my initial feeling as well when I said, are we going to do a platonic dialogue? But Zach says here, I don't think arguing is going to go anywhere. Uh, and I'm feeling this right now. And he quotes U Udi Wertheimer saying, if Luke and Mechanic don't publicly condemn Crowder's disgusting video about Gloria, not supporters should rethink their allegiance. Not clear to me how anyone who has daughters can support this behavior. I'll put a link to this video in the description notes below in which we talk about nepotism at Bitcoin Core. You can watch it for yourself and decide if you agree with Udi and Zach that this is a disgusting video. I thought the mechanics comment here was perfect. Imagine trying to tone police a decentralized network routing around its reference implementation, namely Bitcoin Core, its rep reference implementation having become hostile and corrupt. Now, hopefully Zach has a better intuition for how to run a hardware wallet company than he does for proof of work. I've actually been trying to find a good Bitcoin hardware wallet maker that I can promote for free. I was hoping that Zach's company foundation could step up to the plate, but all I got from Zach were ad hominems and a not very impressive understanding of the current opportune debate, especially when I went to all the trouble of responding to each of his points. And then he dumps me and cites Udi, which is just unbelievable. So I'm going to stick with my cold card for now. If you want to follow this thread and see this discussion about Bitcoin hardware wallet makers, I wanted, I was asking for one who had the cojones to come out unambigu unambiguously against Bitcoin core and spam 
asking for 278,000 people. I'll be speaking with tomorrow. They're buying wallets every day. So I think we should continue to use our economic power to try to hold various Bitcoin companies accountable. And if they're not helping us in our fight against spam and our fight against corruption at Bitcoin Core, then we should publicly call them out. And I, I apologize as well in this tweet. I can't believe I misspelled cojones. I've definitely been playing too much cajon, which is this kind of drum that you sit on, which I do play. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.